You're watching Reason and Theology Live, a show dedicated to charitable discussions, debates, interviews, commentary, and analysis. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examination. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. Welcome back to Reason and Theology, everyone. Your host, Michael. Uh, doing and ask me anything. So send me your questions. Make sure to put them to add Reason and Theology in the chat there. And uh, I'll do my best to answer all questions that come through. I'm not seeing any yet. I see some comments, but no uh, questions yet. I see Joe. Hey, how are you? Rob, good to see you. Father John, good to see you as well. Um, hmm. here's one from Gregory. What do you think are the major problems caused by overlapping church jurisdictions? And what do you think some solutions all are? Also, how damaging could changing the status quo be? Um, is this jurisdictions in the Catholic Church or are you referring to in the Orthodox churches? Because I think this is more an issue in the Orthodox churches. Um, we do have overlapping jurisdictions to an to an extent in a sense um according to right uh but there's no rival altars and there's also no um overlap in jurisdiction within a particular right so we don't exactly have that to my knowledge in the catholic church unless you're referring to different rights in the catholic church that might share the same territory and what are maybe some problems that come with that i mean in in the catholic church i am not aware of any particular problems that have come up lately although i know historically there have been some uh for example john ireland an old school latin rite bishop wasn't happy with married Eastern Catholic priests in the United States. He thought it would be scandalous, and so it caused all kinds of problems. Uh, ultimately, we do have recourse to the Holy Father, to the Pope, so we're able to solve those problems. But I can't think of any offhand. Maybe if you can bring some specific examples um, to the table, I can comment on them. Did Rome ever accept Trullo in total? This is a very complicated issue. There's some sources like Henry Chadwick who says that Rome in 787 accepted Trullo entirely. I, I'm not so sure about that one. He does not cite any sources for it, which I don't find to be helpful if you're going to make a claim, especially like that. Uh, cite your source, please. Um but he, he doesn't do that, although he has in this work that I'm referring to, East and West, there's plenty of stuff he does cite, and it's very well done. It's a great book, don't get me wrong, but sometimes he makes claims in there, and I'm just thinking, um, yeah, it would be nice if you gave me a source here for this, but he doesn't do it. And that's one of those occasions, to my recollection, he doesn't give a source. Um, there are some, There's some indication that Rome ended up accepting... Um, Trullo, at least insofar as it doesn't contradict um, Latin practices, because there were some canons in there that would contradict Latin practices. And it's absurd to suggest that Rome accepted those things that contradicts its own practices. Um, so I don't see any evidence that it's ever done that, but I do see evidence that it, ha it has accepted some of Trullo. And even to this day, we accept some of Trullo in the Eastern Catholic churches. So if you look at um, the Eastern Catholic Code of Canon Law, there are plenty of references to the canons of Trullo. But obviously, we're not accepting everything in there. But um, And Rome is not accepting everything in there by promulgating that. It's, it's obviously saying these canons are in an Eastern context. But... As far as Rome accepting all of the canons for itself, I'm not aware of any hard evidence backing that up. But I, you know, if there's something out there, I'm, I'm open to hearing it. Uh, thank you for the super chat there, uh, Enoch. 
He says, no question, just wanted to support. Thank you. I appreciate that so much. Everybody also go and check out Enoch's uh, channel. And he did a rap battle recently. It was pretty cool, a rap battle with a Lutheran uh, where they were debating Catholic and Lutheran theology. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> I've never seen a, a theology rap battle debate before. That was It was pretty unique and awesome, I have to say. Both of them did well. Although, obviously, I don't agree with the Lutheran. Um, okay. Hmm. Is it possible for Francis to reverse humane vitae on contraception? All right. So this is this is one that it depends on how you see humane vitae and this issue. So some, like Francis Sullivan, are going to argue that humane vitae is authoritative yet non-definitive. Um, and others are going to argue it's definitive by way of the ordinary and universal magisterium. And if that's the case, it's not reversible. If Francis Sullivan is right, it is reversible. So if Francis Sullivan is right, Pope Francis could reverse it. Uh, I don't, although I don't think he's going to. Um, and if it's not reversible, obviously he couldn't reverse it because uh, it would be definitive. So, um, some of the reasons why people like Sullivan want to say that humane vitae is non-definitive is they're going to say for the ordinary and universal magisterium, you have a really high standard to prove it. And the standard is Pius IX, who's the first to use it in a magisterial document, the, the term ordinary magisterium, here referring to the ordinary and universal in uh to us uh the why am i drawing a blank on the to us libenter uh yeah that's uh, who us libenter um in the document to us libenter he um notes that it is the constant teaching of the catholic theologians that identifies the ordinary and universal, which is curious because when we speak of the ordinary and universal, by the time we get to um, Vatican I, we're not talking about the theologians, we're talking about the bishops. But it's curious that Pius IX speaks of the constant teaching of the, of the theologians, the Catholic theologians. And what Sullivan is going to want to do is he's going to say there hasn't been a constant teaching of the theologians that humane vitae is definitive, um, and he's also going to argue that it's not only that you have to have a constant teaching, but it has to constantly be taught that it's definitive, not constantly taught. In other words, it has to be constantly taught that it's definitive um, by the Catholic theologians or the bishops, setting aside that issue. Um that's where people like Francis Sullivan are coming from. They're going to say, look, Catholic theologians have not constantly taught this. Therefore, it's not ordinary and universal. Um, my difficulty with Sullivan there and the problem that I have with Sullivan in the way he understands the ordinary and universal there is, though I understand what he's basing it on, he's basing it on phrases and in and, and these magisterial documents. I think he's interpreting them so strictly that other occasions where the magisterium has said the ordinary and universal magisterium has ruled on this already, it would make no sense of those cases. So in other words, I, I'm, the cases where the magisterium has said the ordinary and universal magisterium has ruled on this, I look at those cases and, you know, it's kind of hard to say that the Catholic theologians have always taught it or taught it as definitive at least in the strict way that Sullivan is saying. So with the way the magisterium seems to understand ordinary and universal, I guess it interprets those things a little lo more loosely than Sullivan. So that's the problem that I think he has in um, his understanding of the ordinary and universal, which then causes him to think that humane vitae is non-definitive. So Sullivan accepts humane vitae and he adheres to it, but he doesn't think it's definitive for that reason. Um, so it's all going to depend on how you land on that issue.
Um, let's see. More of a suggestion. You should just make a video just answering people's concerns with Vatican II without saying who says what, just listing the alleged problems and answering directly. Okay. It's a good suggestion. Um, let's see. Mm. Have I read uh, Stephen Dominic's Orthodoxy and Heterodoxy? A while back, yes. I invited him on the show a while back as well, and he um, I, he, he didn't um, seem to be uh, available. Um, however, his friend came on. Uh, that other guy, the Anglican one, um, he kind of ha- does shows with as a co-host. Uh, he came on the show, but... Yeah, it it didn't seem like he was too interested. Uh, I've read the book, though. Um, You say, I've read through the chapter on Catholicism and nearly pulled my hair. I usually love them. Yeah, I I wasn't impressed with this, and this was when I was studying to become Orthodox. So I was very disposed to, you know, want to see what he had to say, and I found it unconvincing in some cases, and I found it to be misrepresenting Catholicism in some cases. I I don't think he intended to. I don't, I don't think he had any intentions of misrepresenting Catholicism. I just think that that's part of the problem of a person who's on the outside looking in, trying to criticize it without being fully aware of certain things. Um, but that was part of the problem that I experienced in Orthodoxy period. Um, I, I would constantly hear from people Oh, so you're formerly Catholic, you're Orthodox now? Yeah, I'm, I'm Orthodox. Oh, so you used to be Catholic? Yeah, I used to be Catholic. Oh, and then they would just start talking about Catholicism and they would com- be completely wrong in how they rep- represented Catholic- Catholics. And I'm just thinking, that's that's not true. <laughs> that's not right. You're not representing Catholics correctly. Um, n- you know, constantly had to encounter that from people who who should know better in some cases. Um, okay, let's see what else. Hmm. Uh, I don't have any hard, you know, opinions on the date of Exodus. Um, but I tell you who's a good person to ask that question. Uh, Lewis, he did go through the book of Exodus on this channel. So go and watch that show where we did through the scriptures on the book of Exodus with Lewis Dizon. Um, I have a question. What is the difference between Orthodox and Catholics? I've read that the Orthodox are more into mysticism. That's a popular myth, but that's certainly not true. Um, there is plenty of mysticism in the West, <clears throat> and there's plenty of scholasticism in the East. So I I don't buy this myth. Um so yeah, I'm I'm not impressed by it, but I see it being peddled around often. It's usually being peddled by people who have an axe to grind against the Catholic Church, by the way. Is it impossible for a Catholic to be a universalist? I've seen some attempted proposals by Catholic theologians. I just don't see how you could maintain universalism in light of Luke 13, when Jesus says that some will not be saved when they ask him point blank the question about you know will will all be saved will some not be saved when they're asking him the question of salvation he point blank says some will not i I don't see how to get around that um moreover i also don't see when it when it talks about in the confession of faith at Lateran four that there will be those who endure perpetual punishment with the devil, it's is it is it just speaking hypothetically? That's hard to believe that we're just speaking about something hypothetically in a confession of faith. Um 
so I just don't see how Catholics are able to maintain that um, in light of what Scripture and the Magisterium says about this. I, I'd like to see some interaction with those things. Oddly enough, it's Francis Sullivan who points to Lateran Four to say that that view is excluded. So where he, he, he comes with a more liberal interpretation of Humanae Vitae, here he is coming with a very conservative interpretation of this issue. Um, it's a good question here from Dylan, and thank you for the um, super chat. Um, or Dylan. How do I uh, respectfully approach my local priest about doing mass reverently at Oriental Incense Gregorian chant? It's it's of course going to depend on if you have a rapport with him or not. I would develop a rapport first. You you don't want to be one where you try to go and ask the priest that and he doesn't really know you well. He's not going to listen to you. Uh, but it means a lot more whenever you kind of have a rapport with him. So develop a relationship with him and then. Um, you know, once you have that, whenever it kind of comes up, it's opportune to bring it up where it's it's not awkward. It's it's kind of maybe in the context of something y'all are talking about, you can just kind of bring the subject up then um, to where it's it's not awkward. You know, uh, maybe you could ask them, you know, what do you what do you think of ad orientum and, and stuff like that? I've seen liturgies like that and just see if that, you know, feel them out at that point. <laughs> um Okay, so how do you respond to those who say Jews worship the same God as us? Usually people ask that question about Muslims. Um, as far as Jews, um, I, don't, I don't know how that would be controversial. Um, obviously they do, but they do so in an imperfect way since they don't worship God as, as the Trinity. Um, so there's an imperfect understanding on their part of God. But the God of the Old Testament is not a different God than the God of the New Testament. So if they're worshiping the God of the Old Testament, though imperfectly, they're worshiping the God of the New Testament, but imperfectly. Um, some get tripped up over First John. If you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father. Um, but that's in context of people that are in a position to already know the truth about the Son. You have to realize that the vast majority of people who are Jewish today, their understanding of Christianity is so different than what it actually is that I'm not certain most of them are actually rejecting what Christianity is. I'm not saying that they would accept it if they knew what it was. I'm just saying that a lot of times you'd be shocked what they think Christians believe. Um, so I would say they worship the same God as Christians, however imperfectly, just as we've historically said the same thing about Muslims. The traditional Catholic view is that they worship the one God, but imperfectly. Um, and their worship is not salvific. So in other words, a Muslim worshiping the one God doesn't doesn't bring them any kind of salvation. Um, a person can worship the one true God and have heresy, for example. So, are they are they uh, entering into the divine life of God? Are they participating in His divine life? No. Um, they might not have a heresy in their understanding of God, but maybe they have a heresy somewhere else. So it's possible to worship God while still not be living in his grace. And so for me, I don't get tripped up over that issue. Um, the bigger question is, okay, so what? They, they worship the one God, however imperfectly, all right? But are they walking in the ways of God, are they participating in his divine life? That's a tougher question to answer. And that's where they're in serious danger. That's why we proclaim the gospel to them. Um, yeah, so I, I see it alleged that Rome accepted the true canons due to indirect citations. Right, I've seen the indirect, but I, I need something a little more concrete than that. Um, I really need to see where Rome accepts 
condemnation of its own practices. That's just really illogical. For example, Adrian the first praising the orthodoxy of the synodal letter of Saint Serasius, but about images. Right. I I understand, but I need to see that he accepted it in full. And I'm not seeing concrete evidence for that. It doesn't mean it's not out there, but I'd, I'd like to see it. Um, even if there was a pope who did, I, I do think that that's could be reversed. I mean, accepting some of these canons, uh, I mean, most of that is going to be disciplinary. So I could see a pope accepting them and then another reversing that. I mean, it's it's possible to reverse the acceptance of a dis discipline. So if even if you find that, I don't think that's a problem for the Catholic Church. Hence, why I don't understand why so many people have an obsession with this question. Um, not saying anything about the question, or it's a legitimate question that you ask, but I, I notice this keeps circulating on the internet as if this is really relevant to Catholics and Orthodox as far as where the truth is. Um... Yeah, what are what are my thoughts about Charlemagne and the Franks and the popular talking points among Orthodox blaming them for the schism? I, I think the death blow for this thesis is the fact that you find the Catholic dogmas of the papacy and the filioque prior to the Franks. So, you know, the Franks could have never existed and we would still have this issue in the first millennium where the west is maintaining certain things that the east no longer accepts so what do we do with that and how do we make sense of that in light of this thesis so that's why i think it's pretty weak thesis um okay looking through um hmm. vatican three when <laughs> your boy eb asks <laughs> you had to bring it up right <laughs> um <sighs> hopefully a very long time from now the last thing you want is another ecumenical council right now. <laughs> I I used to think it'd be a good idea. Yeah, not anymore. <laughs> was this St. Gregory he presided over uh, 381 Constantinople 1? He was saying that, you know, he, he it's just best to not have a council. <laughs> you know, he resigned at one point. Um, he was really disillusioned with ecumenical councils, and he didn't see them favorably at all um and it's partly understandable why and that is every time we have an ecumenical council it causes a huge uproar and then we have to have another ecumenical council to clean it up and then that one also left some business undone and so we have to have another one to clean that one up <laughs> that's the story of the third the fourth the fifth the sixth ecumenical councils <laughs> um we haven't implemented Vatican II well enough to have a third council. And if you had a third council to try to pick up the mess of Vatican II and the lack of implementation of Vatican II, um, not that I think Vatican II is really problematic in itself. So when I say the mess of Vatican II, I'm talking especially about its implementation. Um, if you were to have a third Vatican you know, Vatican III right now, here's what's going to happen. Same thing that happened with Vatican II, except way worse. You had uh, the, the Council of the Media reporting all kinds of things that wasn't true about the Council. And that was when they had, you know, the media of the 60s. Can you imagine with every cardinal and every bishop able to tw tweet out their experience of the council how much misinformation would be shared on social media on a daily basis and how confusing things would be uh, the only way we could have an ecumenical council at this point is it would have to be completely you know 
no bishop can talk about its decisions and discussions until something's officially promulgated i mean that would be the only way to do it and and how are you going to do that how are you going to keep like all the bishops and cardinals silent for however many months or years it takes to you know <laughs> to to have the council um i just don't see how it could be done in a way that wouldn't cause more confusion so hopefully it'll be a long time before we get a vatican three um hmm what are your thoughts on some recent young Catholic converts spending a lot of time making YouTube videos, debating theology and getting involved, involved in politics? Well, I applaud their zeal for the faith. Um, but I've noticed a lot of it tends to be brash. Reminds me of myself when I was, you know, in my twenties and so, you know, such, um, a lot of them tend to be very black and brash, very, um, overly confident about their positions that they shouldn't be so confident about not aware of their limitations as one theologian has put it um i think that's true there's a lot of them who are not aware of their limitations um so again i applaud the zeal but sometimes i kind of wonder you know they're doing more damage than good <laughs> uh but uh, you know it's a mixed bag some people do good some people not so much. Um, let's see. Why have the recently deceased popes been canonized so quickly? Yeah. Yeah, I kind of think that the timeliness of some of these canonizations is imprudent. It gives the wrong impression. It gives the impression that we're being way too flippant, flippant about canonizing saints. Um, so I kind of I kind of question that as well. But um at the same time i think there's also some wisdom behind opening up um behind canonizing more people than before and that is to show us um before whenever we had fewer canonizations it gives the impression that sanctity and holiness is almost unattainable um, whereas when you see many more canonizations as we do in the post-conciliar era, um, it shows that sanctity is more attainable. So there, there's some good that comes from it. Um, looks like there's a super chat. Let me grab that. Mm -hmm. what, it, what would it take for the Church of England to be convinced that Rome has the true faith? Would it be a huge membership decline? Um, you know, I don't think that the Church of England is in any position to answer that question at the moment when they can't answer very basic and fundamental questions. So I think that they need to answer very basic and fundamental questions on sexuality, on um, ministry, and once they get the basics back down, then maybe we can talk about ecclesiology relating to Rome. I just don't think they're in a position to consider that right now. Um, so what book can you re recommend that refutes all the Messianic prophecies that Jews claim have not been fulfilled by Jesus the Messiah? So um, it's by a Protestant, and you need to... Um, ignore some of the anti-Catholic material he has, but I've had him on the show before, Dr. Michael Brown. He has a good five book or five volume series on this that's helpful. Um, also, Dr. Lawrence Feingold has put out some work uh, dealing with Jewish prophecies. I've had him on the show talking about them, but he has a few books that deal with um the Messiah and the Old Testament and stuff like that. So maybe check those out. Their biggest criticism is going to be that the Messiah is said to bring peace to the world. There clearly isn't peace in the world. Therefore, Jesus isn't the Messiah. That's their main argument. Um, 
And at the end of the day, when you understand that we can understand the coming of the Messiah as being twofold, one bringing peace internally to souls and then bringing peace to the entire world in a second coming, that deals with the discrepancies because there are other passages that seem to indicate that the Messiah will be put to death and that his ministry would be a seeming failure. So how do they account for those? We can account for them with the two comings of the Messiah. It's hard for them to account for it whenever you have those conflicting passages, seemingly conflicting passages about the Messiah in the Old Testament. Um, yeah, so let's see. Let me scroll back up. Um, <laughs> this is a good question uh, by Jay. In your opinion, suppose we time travel on the day of crucifixion. Is there a chance that we will be recorded in the gospel if approach and talk to Jesus uh, while he's, he's crucified? Well, I mean, you, you can already time travel, if you will, to the crucifixion in every Eucharistic liturgy. Uh, but I get what you're saying. You're, you're saying actually time travel to the time in which he shed his blood on the cross. Um, would you be recorded in the gospel? <laughs> Yeah, so I don't think that Scripture would be rewritten because um, I do believe in the inspiration of Scripture, and I don't see it fitting that God would allow in one timeline Scripture to be this way, but then in another timeline it to be altered. Um, I think that causes problems to the inspiration of Scripture. So I just don't see that happening. Um, it's a good question, though. Okay, let's see what else we have here in the chat. Um, let's see. Um, do you believe that it's okay for Eastern Catholics to believe St. Luke Paine at the first icon? I think it's okay to believe that as a pious legend. Um how however i do question sometimes the prudence of of that because if christians were painting icons in the first century that would have been exactly what the jews would have used against us and yet they don't use that against us um why is it the jews did not claim we were idolaters that's exactly what they would have said though if we were painting icons so i appreciate the piety of somebody who who wants to believe that legend but I just, I don't think that that's tenable, realistically. Um, and I, I kind of wonder if that presents the Christian faith in a way that would make someone think that it lacks credibility. So if, if I were a non-Christian and somebody told me that, I would have, I would think that, you know, Christianity lacks credibility. Um, so again, I appreciate the piety, but I, I kind of question the prudence of it. Um, let's see. So John says, to clarify, I wasn't meaning to imply that Rome accepted the canons, only why some allege it. Right, but I just don't see how they allege that based on those instances. Uh, but maybe I'm missing something. Reason and Theology Council on Twitter when? <laughs> that would be interesting. My Twitter feed is where all the fun happens. So I can only imagine. <laughs> um, let's see. What else we got in here? Um, what would you say to somebody that thinks Catholicism diminishes one's full potential? I suppose I'd have to understand a little bit more what do they mean by it diminishes one's full potential. If they mean that Catholicism is wrong and so you're putting certain limitations morally and restrictions on yourself morally that would prevent you from having a particular 
life. Um, well, if Catholicism is false, then there's probably some truth to that. Um, but if Catholicism is true, I'm not diminishing my life. I'm, I'm actually living it to the fullest of its potential. Um, let's see. Looking through the chat. Thought on Scott Hahn's book, uh, Supper of the Lamb. I loved it. I loved it. I thought it was awesome. It gives a really good understanding of the book of Revelation liturgically. I really enjoyed it. You'll also want to get Michael Barber's book on the book of Revelation. I think it's Singing in the Rain. Um, let's see. If we are considering changing rights, what are the most important factors we should consider? Well, consider first of all that you only get to do this once in a lifetime. So are you really sure you want to do that? Um, so that's a pretty big deal. Um, and also consider why are you doing it? What are your intentions and motivations? Is it to get away from something? So make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. It's not to get away from something. It's that that right is where you find the best way that you're able to participate in the life of the church. Um, could the Pope exercise his charism of papal infallibility in a tweet? He could. He certainly should not. Um, but he could in the sense that um, Christ, whenever he instituted the papacy, never specified the particular setting in which a pope is going to exercise papal infallibility that's left for the church to decide so the pope is able to decide in what setting he will exercise his charism um he could choose to use that charism in the setting of a papal tweet but that would be ridiculously irresponsible i think now i think that he could issue it in a papal bull and then they could say on twitter hey a new papal bull is out or something i think it's great to use social media i'm just saying i don't think using twitter would be a good way to do that because most people won't perceive that as something ex cathedra because it's coming from a tweet and we've never seen something ex cathedra from a tweet before so it would be best to use an apostolic constitution like we've done previously um thank you for the super chat uh dylan i understand it could be both and but would it be better to have groups and societies focus solely on celebrating the novus ordo reverently instead of the tridency mass would that not be productive so you're asking would it be better to have uh, a group that focuses only on celebrating the novus ordo reverently instead of the tridency mass i mean i think that it would help at this point because um, we certainly need to fix the way that the Novus Ordo is being celebrated in practice. It's not going away. The Novus Ordo is not going away. Uh, I remember I was talking about, I was talking to a priest that I used to drive really far to every Saturday. Uh, I had to drive several hours to go to a TLM. And I asked the priest, you know, so when do you think the Novus Ordo will go away? <laughs> and he's just saying, it's not going any way, anywhere anytime soon. So um, you need to you need to kind of give up on that one. Uh, he didn't put it in those exact words, but that was the effect of it. <laughs> and when he said that, it, it kind of jolted me. It, it got me thinking, you know, he's right. The Novus Ordo is not going anywhere. So this dream of, you know, Pressing the reset button is not going to happen. What we're going to need to do is repair the way the Novus Ordo is being celebrated. So anything that would be productive to that end, I'm all for. Um, have I been to divine liturgies of other Eastern Catholic rites? I have. I've also served at some. Um, so I served at a Cyril Malabar one years ago. And here in my chapel, we just had a Maronite priest a few weeks ago. Uh, so that's a non-Byzantine liturgy. 
but it's a uh, Eastern right. Um, I think there's another super chat. Let me grab that one. Thank you, Daniel, for the super chat. What should I do or say as an Eastern Catholic who has family members who openly say we aren't fully Catholic and have said we receive less grace? They feel the Latin Mass is the only way. It might not do any good, but you could point them to what the Magisterium has said in Vatican II, where the church is very clear that all of the rights of the church are equal in dignity and value. Um, but if they won't listen to the church, there's a deeper problem there. So they, they have then a deeper problem than denigrating the Eastern churches if they won't listen to the magisterium. Um, and if they think that you receive less grace, then they're superstitious because it is not a, a specific set of words that gives you more grace. Uh, grace comes through the sacraments and it's based on your disposition to the sacraments all of the rites have the sacraments so the availability of grace in all of the rites is the same and the the amount of grace that you have available to you in each eucharist is infinite you don't receive an infinite amount of graces because you're not disposed to them you only receive what you're disposed to and that will be the same regardless of which right you go to. So I would say that they have a faulty understanding of grace that really borders on superstition. Uh, I think, I suspect they have a deeper problem than this criticism of Eastern Catholicism. I suspect that they have a resistance towards the magisterium. And that's really at the root of this. Um, but this Latin rite supremacy is really repulsive i've i've seen it circulating among people and it's it's very repulsive i don't know why some people maintain that but some some have this perspective that the latin rite is supreme and they denigrate the other rites of the catholic church and they're denigrating the gifts of god when they do that um so i think they're taking the wrong approach Let's see what else we have. Yeah, why do we have Jesus in Scripture weeping but not laughing? That's a good question. Really good question. Because I've, I've, I've wondered that myself. Now, we obviously know that Jesus did laugh um, because he's fully human. So as a theological conclusion of virtually revealed truth, by way of a theological conclusion we know that he laughed but um it's not directly revealed you're right as far as why i hmm, you got me on that one um so northern thinks that tlm communities and novus ordo ones should be two rights i don't think that that's a good idea i think you'll make the situation way worse if you do that uh it, sh it shouldn't be two rights um, same commenter thinks Anglican norm Chaiti books, which should be a separate, separate right as well. Um, I think you would just cause more problems to the situation if that were to happen. Um, I think it would be better to um, repair the Roman right so that it has one form again. Um, by the way, don't confuse the Roman Rite with the Latin Rite. Um, let's see. <laughs> uh, let me check something here. Looking through the chat. Are Orthodox still considered formally as heretics, or is that rhetoric toned down since Vatican II? Um, so I think that it's certainly the case that anybody who's not in full communion with the Holy See is materially in schism. Um, and could they could also potentially be materially in heresy since if they're not in communion with the Pope, they probably deny papal supremacy. Um, 
but formally in schism and formally in heresy, that's harder to ascertain. So I think that we would say, and this hasn't always, and this has been, let me, let me rephrase. We haven't always perceived the Orthodox in the exact same way. There's been many cases where we've seen the Orthodox in more of a formally heretical light. And in other cases, we've seen them as materially in heresy. Uh, like St. Thomas Aquinas wants to see them more materially, most of them more materially in schism, uh, rather than formally schismatics. And that's bled over into us sharing the sacraments in many instances historically, way before Vatican II. So there's never been just one view prior to Vatican II. It's it's just kind of been a, a mixed bag, but especially since the 1750s, both sides have really hardened themselves against each other. And that's when you start to see each other really saying that the other one is formally schismatic and formally an heresy. Prior to that, it wasn't as clear cut in many cases. But after the 1750s, both sides really hardened, and it only led up more on the Catholic side. We led up um, after Vatican II. So I would say the way we understand it now is that an Orthodox would materially be in schism and would materially hold to heresy potentially. But are they formally in schism and formally in heresy is a different question it could be that they are i think that there are some orthodox that are uh some of the ones that are frequenting youtube pretty often probably are formally heretics and formally in schism um but formal heresy and formal schism requires a person to know better and they're acting against it acting against the truth and that and and that just doesn't speak to many orthodox they're not acting against what they know to be true but it does speak to some people who are on youtube um let's see what else okay i really hope you write a book for the average layperson explaining the magisterium what is reformable and what is not is there really room for such a book? Um, I know not everything has been touched on in the books that are out there, but it seems like there's a general availability of this stuff. Not to the extent that could really be achieved, but I don't know if we would have an average layperson book at that point. So is there really an audience for that? Whenever I've suggested it, uh, to publishers, I didn't get any interest, so I've kind of said, okay, whatever, and uh, left that one alone. Uh, what else? Hmm. Okay, let's see. What will you do in November? There will be no nuance for you to expound. Will you be out of a job? I'm, I'm not following what's going on in November that I won't have any uh, nuance to expound. <laughs> Help me out here. Um, yeah, so what if a bishop doesn't allow ad orientum or some Latin for the Novus Ordo? What's the next best option? Prayer besides being charitable and dialogue. Yeah, I mean, there's not a whole lot more of options unless um, the bishop changes his mind now. According to Canon 2.12, you have a right and even a duty to respectfully and charitably make your needs known to your bishop. But if your bishop still ignores that and doesn't want that, I mean, at the end of the day, it's the bishop who's going to give an account to God for that. Um, don't let that be a deal breaker between you and the church, though. Um... So there is speculation Francis might change moral teachings on contraception. Can he 
change prior teachings regarding immorality of contraception. So that was, I think, the first question that I answered at the beginning of the stream, so go and watch it. Uh, but as far as speculation about this, it's just that. And I think the people who are speculating on it, I, I'm not so sure that that's being responsible because all that is doing is it's getting people riled up and um, getting people angry. And it could be that they're stirring up dissension um, without a good reason. What it, if nothing comes from this? At that point, they would have stirred up the troops for nothing. Um, so I have to really question the prudence and responsibility of those who do this. What Bible verses talk about purgatory? You'll want to start, of course, with First, first Corinthians 3. Um, it's speaking about the second coming and the final judgment, but there's a concept of purification there, and I think that a purification of the um, immediate judgment is, is, is certainly... Um, is, is something that can be seen as analogous to the purification that's being expressed at the uh, second coming in the final judgment in 1 Corinthians 3. What's my biggest concern with the Tridentine Mass? I mean, I don't have a big concern with the Mass itself. There were some things that needed to be reformed about it, but none of those were issues that are harmful to souls. But we could certainly say there were some aspects of, of the Tridency Mass that were not ideal. They were certainly not ideal. Um, but nothing that was harmful. So I, I don't have any concerns per se. I do have concerns with the way people are using the TLM incorrectly to be in dissent against the post-conciliar church. I have a concern there. Okay. Do you think there is a case to be made for completely ignoring scandals and focusing on the inner life? Well, I certainly understand the need to focus on the inner inner life and not preoccupy ourselves with scandals, but I don't think that it's necessary that we completely tune out the scandals. I think that we need to be aware of some things that are going on in the church um, insofar as it is applicable for our state in life. Uh, if this is something useful for you to know for your state in life, then, uh, you know, look into it. If it's not, yeah, it's probably not best for you to get into it. Um, hmm. Let's see. What else do we have? The duck says, so I'm a convert. I hear many people complain about the Novus Ordo, but I don't understand the problem. Most people just tell me it's not as reverent, but I still don't get it. What is the problem? So when I first converted uh, to Catholicism, I did not understand the Latin Mass, and I was more in favor of the Novus Ordo. Um, especially because of the vernacular. So at first I didn't understand why people ragged on the Novus Ordo and why some people were all about the Latin Mass. Um, it took me some time to learn and understand why people had, you know, a certain, certain concerns with the Novus Ordo. And that then made me then study also the Latin Mass and its history. And I then be, had, began, began to have more of an appreciation for the Latin Mass. Um, so I understand where you're at. I'll say this. The concerns with the Novus Ordo aren't so much for the Novus Ordo itself, but the concerns are with abuses of the Novus Ordo. Don't confuse the two, because they're not the same. That being said... There are some legitimate criticisms that can be made of the Novus Ordo as it's promulgated. 
as it's officially in the rubrics. The actual thing, not as it's abused, but the thing itself. There are some things that we could criticize about it and say, you know what? We need to fix this in the Novus Ordo. But the majority of the problems aren't problems with the Novus Ordo itself. The problems with abuses of the Novus Ordo. So that's what people are generally upset about with the Novus Ordo is abuses, although they don't think it's abuses. They think it represents the Novus Ordo itself. So don't let them mislead you. But that's where they're coming from. And they see that the Novus, the, the Latin Mass tends to be more reverent. So they tend to gravitate towards the Latin Mass. So hopefully that helps clarify the issue. Um, let's see. Any books you'd recommend to help people better understand the Magisterium? I know of Jimmy Aiken's book, Teaching with Authority, Others for a Lay Person. Yeah, Aiken's book is great. Um, Dulles, it's not a long book, but Avery Dulles has one on the Magisterium. You're going to want to get that. Um, and then you'll also want to get Francis Sullivan's book, Creative Fidelity. Uh, with those three, you got a really good introduction. Hmm. Would the Old Testament people or the intertestamental pe people have had a sense of understanding of the Trinity, although not a full understanding as in the New Testament? They certainly didn't have a full understanding of the new of the trinity um saint gregory and some of the church fathers tell us that even in their day like the Gabadocians are telling us even in their day um the issue of the holy spirit being divine was not um you know was was not necessarily something that everybody believed and he tries to explain that and he wants to say that, you know, there's a reason why that only now in our generation that we're really becoming aware of the deity of the Holy Spirit. And it's because of the fact that, uh, you know, if God had revealed himself as a trinity too early on, we would have gone into idolatry. It's a really interesting quote from Gregory. Not sure if I agree with it, but um, liturgically, we certainly maintained the trinity, but did everybody believe that the holy spirit was consubstantial with the father not really and there were a lot of people who didn't um and that's why we we had to have the work of basil and others who fought against those who fought against the holy spirit the nomado makis i think is what they were calling those who fight against the holy spirit um so we, even into the patristic era, we're still dealing with that issue. So definitely prior to the New Testament, they wouldn't have had a fully developed understanding of the Trinity. In the intertestamental period, you do have some further development with the Logos, with the Word, um, and some of the deuterocanonical books. So you start to have a hint of it there. And in the protocanonical books, you also have a hint that god might be more than one person um and some jews you know picked up on this concept of two powers in heaven so you you do have some people who are starting to open their eyes to these things but it's certainly not as we fully understand in the new testament as it's been developed in the patristic era Ah, uh, okay. Hardest subject in theology? Hmm. Hmm. Back in the day, I would have said eschatology. Not anymore. Theology proper is going to be the hardest. Um, because there's some questions dealing with the simplicity of God um, and how that relates to the Trinity and, and how that relates to creation and, and things like that. 
that I think is more complicated than questions about eschatology. Okay. Okay. What else do we have? I think there's a super chat here. Why was the gospel of James rejected and condemned? I think I've answered that one before. Uh, thank you for the super chat. John, did you ask me that question before? Seems like I've been asked that a couple times. Um, the gospel of James specifically, I don't recall, but I can speak in general about the acceptance of the canon. And what was accepted was what was handed down to us in the apostolic churches. Um, so that's what Rome, Hippo, and Carthage in the late 4th, early 5th century accepted. And the Gospel of James just simply wasn't one of it. It, it wasn't one of the ones that was handed down to us through apostolic succession. Um, as I mentioned, true events about the life of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Um, I think you're referring to the Proto-Evangelium of James. Um, I don't generally hear it, though, as the Gospel of James, but just putting that to the side. Um, it's curious if, if you're referring to the Proto-Evangelium. Um, I remember in Vespers there were some aspects to Vespers that were similar to the Proto-Evangelium. Um, so I think that we could say that there might be some aspects of it that's true. Um, I think there's another super chat here. Let me grab it. Uh, what do I love most about the Catholic Church? The liturgy. And obviously in the liturgy, I'm including the sacraments of the liturgy. I'm not talking about just the liturgy as the liturgy. Let me make that very clear. Uh, the liturgy without the sacraments is, is going to be still great. And it's good to praise God and it's good to pray to God and it's still beautiful. But I mean, the, the sacraments obviously is going to be where it's at. Um, but I'm especially talking about the liturgy of, of the Eucharist. So thank you for the super chat. Can the extension form be done in the vernacular? Oh, uh, extraordinary form. I'm sorry. Can the extraordinary form be done in the vernacular while keeping parts in Latin and the Kyrie in Greek? Um, yeah, but I think that most people who would end up in who would do the extraordinary form would say that it's better to do more Latin than the vernacular, but you might find some priests who do the extraordinary form that are fond with it. I think there should be priority for the vernacular. Um, since that tends to be the way it's understood, um, in vast parts of church history, um, the divine liturgy is in Eastern Catholic Church. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by, are you asking, do we do the divine liturgy in the Eastern Catholic Church? In, in the Byzantine Catholic Churches, we celebrate the divine liturgy of Chrysostom and St. Basil, if that's what you're asking, yes. Um, in some of the other Eastern Catholic Churches that are non-Byzantine, they have other other ones why wasn't the tridency mass just celebrated in the vernacular um we have the translated missiles well the reason why is um the second vatican council did ask for further reforms than just a, an allowance for the vernacular it did ask for um a reform to the missile itself and it gave down the instructions on what was to be done um some of the changes that ended up coming 
into the liturgy were went beyond the reforms that the council fathers asked for but they were done under the supervision and then promulgated with the authority of the pope and so the pope has that authority um to supersede a council and so he promulgated the Novus Ordo as um as you know and so might we say hmm some of the things that Paul the sixth and some of the things that we have in the third edition of the Roman Missal might it be good to dial back some of those things and maybe go in some cases go back to what the council fathers were more looking for yeah, I think so. I think if we're going to revise the Roman Missal at this point, it needs to be a revision back in the direction of what the Council Fathers were asking for rather than what was um, done in the post-conciliar era by Bunini and his concilium and Paul the Sixth. Um but should we just have the Latin the Latin Mass, the Tridentine Mass, and just the vernacular? No, I don't think that's good enough either because there were some aspects to it that needed to be reformed, such as a restoration of the chalice to the laity. That was really important. Um, and more active participation. And I know that active participation can also include an interior disposition. So it doesn't necessarily have to be external. Um, but don't go to the extreme in thinking that it doesn't also mean and include external features. It does include external features as well. And they, the Council Father certainly intended that. Um, let's see. What else we have here? Looking through the chat. Do I publicly condemn the outrageous errors of Michael Mofton? That's funny. You'll have to list them for me. Is there a syllabus of errors for Michael Mofton? Maybe you can draw up the syllabus of errors and I'll I'll let you know if I'll I'll give my uh my platchet. And uh I'll let you know if I'll promulgate it on a show. <laughs> uh <laughs> How likely is it that the liturgy of Chrysostom was actually made by Chrysostom himself himself? Um so I had a expert on uh, a few months ago and I asked him that question and he says that it's 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 possible that some parts went back to Chrysostom but certainly not the whole thing and that that does seem to ring true in what I've studied but I haven't studied it in the depth that he has so I'd have to defer to him um here I'm talking about um the deacon from Metropolitan Cantor Institute Deacon Jeff so maybe go and check out that show. Just type in Reason and Theology, Deacon Jeff. It'll come up. Favorite Marian doctrine? Probably that um, Mary is the new Eve. I love the um, typology there with her being the new Eve. And um, as far as typology, though, I also like the Ark of the Covenant. But... Um, one that specifically um, is found in some of the apostolic fathers like St. Justin and also Irenaeus is this idea that she's the new Eve. She undid what Eve did. Um, okay. Favorite religious order. I did that one already on the last stream. <laughs> You'll have to go and watch the last AMA. Uh, sneak peek. I, I, they asked me in favorite Latin one, and I said Dominicans. So there's your answer. 
Uh, so Michael Mofton somehow supports the errors of Taylor Marshall and James Martin at the same time. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I I can get behind anathematizing that one. <laughs> I, 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 I will draw up a formal anathema of, of Michael Mofton and I'll promulgate it on RNT just for you. Whoever says that the heirs of Taylor Marshall and the heirs of James Martin are true and good and holy and pious are uh, anathematized and we anathematize them and include them among the, <laughs> the reprobate and, <laughs> and so on and so forth. <laughs> uh <laughs> Uh, thank you for the super chat, Dylan. How do we evangelize Pentecostal types that aren't interested or are suspicious of intellectual and historical arguments for Catholicism? This is tough. Every time I've ever had an experience dealing with a charismatic of this type, I just haven't seen them really open. And I've had that experience even when I was still Protestant. I remember as a Protestant trying to talk to this charismatic person and they thought I was a demon. Seriously, they actually thought I was a demon. You want to know why they thought I was a demon? Because I was telling them some of the problems with their charismatic mentality. And what I was saying made sense to them, especially from scripture. So they thought I had to be a demon because only a demon could twist scripture the way that I was. It could use scripture so convincingly against their views. Um, and the situation got even more and more weird and creepy on their part. Uh, it was really odd. But yeah, they actually thought I was a demon. It was it was so absurd. Um, how to convince them? Man, good luck. Good luck. Um, especially when they're suspicious of intellectual arguments. How can you really reason with a person like that? I mean, I can usually reason with somebody who's of goodwill and has an open mind. But how do you reason with somebody who is against reason itself i'm not sure you can i know you can certainly pray for them and and if there's an opening you know through your friendship or something then maybe you can talk but if they're not open to historical and intellectual arguments you're you're talking to somebody who's irrational and so your question then is how do you reason with someone who's irrational you can't i don't know how it's a good question though Uh, let's see. So given how things are going, would it be wise for Chaz to start weeding themselves off the TLM and start going to the Novus Ordo Mises? I think that, um, or Novus Ordo Masses, I think that both should be doing both. I mean, I think people who are going to the Novus Ordo should also occasionally go to a TLM if they have one available, of course. Um, and those who are going to TLM should also occasionally go to a good Nova Sordo if they have one available, of course. Um, I, th I think we need, and that was the idea of Sumor and Pontificum, is that the two forms would influence each other. And it's, it's unfortunate that Pope Francis is trying to rush the process of making the Roman Rite one form again. It's just, it seems to be too early to do that. It's too soon. So since the extraordinary form is still permitted in many places, according to tradition, traditionus custodis, there, there's, there's a restriction there, but it's still permitted in many cases. Um, so it's reduced, but still permitted. I still think that the people who are going to an ordinary form parish should still go also occasionally to an ordinary form and, and the other way around as well. Um, and that way, the two influence each other. Um, which liturgical form would be best for evangelizing American Protestants? Well, the ordinary form is best to evangelize American Protestants when it's done properly. If it's not being done properly, it's going to have to be the extraordinary form. But 
there's an added barrier there for a lot of Protestants, not all, but many Protestants are going to find the Latin mass very off-putting. Um, and part of it is going to be a catechesis deficiency on their part. They're not going to understand why it's not in the vernacular. They're not going to understand certain aspects to it. There's going to be a catechesis deficiency, but it's just an extra hurdle. Uh, whereas you won't necessarily have some of those concerns in the ordinary form. But what if it's an ordinary form that has a bunch of abuses? Do you really want to evangelize a Protestant with that? No. No. So are we talking about a good Novus Ordo? You know. Um, this is why I think the Eastern Catholics are uniquely positioned to evangelize people today. Um, that being said, there are some additional things that maybe, um, Protestant would have some difficulty with when they encounter some of our liturgies, such as the veneration of icons. Uh, that's going to be a little bit more prominent than it would be in the Roman liturgy. So it's an added challenge. Uh, Morgan says my parish, and by the way, thank you for the super chat. Um, my parish includes Latin hymns and other more traditional elements in the Novus Ordo Mass. Right. I've heard this sometimes referred to as a reverent Novus Ordo. Yeah. And Benedict endorsed it, but I don't know much else. Can you speak on this? Yeah. I think these are fairly common. So um, I think reverent Novus Ordos are, are good, and I've, I've been to many of them. So like I said, I think they're fairly common. And um, when you say Benedict endorsed it, um, what do, you, what do you mean there, Benedict endorsed it? Um, I think that a reverent Novus Ordo is the way that the Novus Ordo is supposed to be done, period. So uh, Latin hymns is not something that is contrary to the rubrics of the Novus Ordo. So that, that's still within the um, rubrics of how the Novus Ordo could be done. You have that option, so... I'm not sure what you mean by Benedict endorsed it because Benedict promulgated the third edition of the Roman Missal. Uh, is that what you mean, maybe? Um, hmm. Okay. Thank you for the soup chat. Are there aspects of the pre-Tridentine Mass we should have kept? Um, there are some readings, liturgical readings, that we certainly should have kept. Uh, we certain, sh I think we should keep. Um, when whenever I say this, it's not absolutely excluded in the Novus Ordo, but at least in practice, I want to say that. The majority of Novus Ordos tend to be versus populum, although the rubrics of the Novus Ordo assumes ad orientum. So it assumes it. So I'm not trying to say this as if the Novus Ordo doesn't allow for it or even assume it, but since it's so rare and uncommon, we tend to think of it as Trident TMS. Unless, unless you're saying pre, you, so you hold on. I may have misread. You said pre tridency mass. Okay, so are you are you referring to prior to quo primum, and 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 not even the Roman rite because quo primum is not really making changes to the Roman rite itself. It's just you know discontinuing some liturgies elsewhere and replacing it with the Roman rite, but it's not really changing the Roman rite a whole lot. So pre quo primum. Hmm. Uh, how far back do we get to go with this question? <laughs> if we get to go really far back, I would like to um, restore the Roman canon to the way that it was said prior to Gregory the Great because it was longer. And after Gregory the Great, he shortened the Roman canon. Can we get the longer Roman canon? Um, Bully McGuire, thank you for the super chat. Do you think the Tudors, Elizabeth and Edwards, are guilty of formal heresy? Yeah, 
that that's that's a that's a tough one. It's it's hard to always make those kinds of judgments, right? I mean, we can certainly say for certain people the situation doesn't necessarily look good. Um, can I make that determination as a private individual? I can't. I could go if if the church made, you know, a judgment on them. Um, but as a private individual, I could say, here's the way it seems. But, I, I, you know, how can you really read a person's heart, uh, especially somebody who's not alive anymore? <laughs> um, let's see. Okay. Favorite Batman film, um, the one with the guy who ended up killing himself after preparing for the role. Uh, what's his name? I forget his name, but he prepared for the role for like six weeks in a hotel room or something. And uh, he, did a, he did it really well. What's his name? Help me out here in the chat. <laughs> uh is it Chris Bailey? I don't know. I may have just butchered his name. Hold on. Uh, let's see. Batman. Christian Bale. I did butcher it. Yeah. It's in Chris Bailey. <laughs> that's not him, though. Okay, so that's not him. It's not Christian Bale who's the one I'm thinking of, although he played Batman, but he's not the one that committed suicide. Heath Ledger. Somebody says he didn't kill himself. Okay, so wait, am I mistaken then? He didn't. I thought he did. So how did he die? Hold on, we we need to Google it. Hold on, <laughs> Heath Ledger. Let's see. I thought he did. Hmm. I'm on Wikipedia here. Um. Found dead in his room in Manhattan. Pronounced dead, body removed. Okay, but what's the cause? Let uh, me Google cause of Heath Ledger death. Um. Well, why am I not finding an easy answer here? Accidental overdose. Got it, got it, got it, got it. It's an accidental overdose. I see. I see. Got my facts wrong. Sad either way. Really sad. It sounds like he went through a lot of depression uh, and, and couldn't shake that role. I don't know if that's true, but it seems like that was something I read a while back. Um, and he could just couldn't shake the role that he prepared for and caused depression but I, I i don't know if that's true um either way i mean that's sad to hear but he played the role so well i didn't i didn't think that anybody else was going to be able to do the joker before him uh better but then he came out with that and i thought wow yeah all right he's the best joker and then then uh, another joker came out after that that wasn't bad uh, the one where he shot, he shoots the guy Murray or whatever on the TV show. I love that scene. That's my favorite scene. He he also did good in uh, playing the Joker. Um, have I done a show addressing Richard War? I need to. Certainly on the list of the million things I got to do. Um, all right, so I think there's some super chats here. Let me grab them. Um, if the missile assumes ad orientum, doesn't the germ in two places say that the priest must face the people anyway? Doesn't that stop arguments for ad orientum? Um, I'm aware of parts in the germ that, um, that would allow for versus populum, but I'm not aware of the parts in the germ that would assume versus populum. Um, now I know that there's some parts where the priest faces the 
people anyway, but that's not against versus, uh, that's not against ad orientum. So I'd have to see the rubrics that you're referring to. Um, what's the best way to discuss with Protestants inconsistency of sola fide with parable of the good Samaritan seems simple, but want to anticipate response. Um, I don't understand your question. Inconsistency of faith alone with the parable of the Good Samaritan. Are you saying that some Protestants are appealing to the parable of the Good Samaritan to say that all that is necessary? Well, okay. Maybe, uh, maybe what you're saying is there's inconsistency with the faith alone idea whenever you have the parable of the Good Samaritan who clearly has works. Is is that the question? Could you maybe clarify that for me? I'm I'm not sure I'm understanding your question, Luke. Um, mm -hmm -hmm. Looking through the chat. Um, Logos agrees it was the best Batman. Yeah, yeah. Although I'm kind of torn with the other one, the other Joker now too, you know. Although, I don't. Yeah, the 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 newer one, I forget what the name of it was, but the one again who shoots the guy named Murray. I just remember him calling the guy Murray, and he shoots him. The the TV show host, best scene ever. <laughs> I love that scene. Just watching that whole scene. Uh, <laughs> watching it unfold with the crowd and everybody there by the way if you don't know about me i always in movies go for the bad guy so i like movies where the bad guy wins um i i hate movies where the good guy wins um the reason why i hate movies where the good guy wins is because it's so predictable <laughs> you know it's like why can't the bad guy win um now obviously in real life i'm going for the good guy but if i'm watching tv um you know, this is not real life, so I can go for the bad guy. So I always go for the bad guy. Um, and it's just so rare that the bad guy ever wins. But it, it kind of seems like he won in that one. I, I liked that part. Um, <laughs> that that reminds me. I don't know if y'all ever saw the Mortal Kombat TV series. It was so cheesy and horrible. Although at the time, I really liked it. But going back and watching a few episodes on YouTube, I saw how horrible it was as far as cheesiness. Um, but again, at the time, I thought it was awesome. <laughs> and uh, I always thought the ending there was fun because um, I don't know if, if they like said, okay, well, you know what, guys, we're canceling your show. So that that's it. Y'all don't get another season. We're canceling it. And you have to cancel the show in the next two episodes. So I don't know if the writers just got angry or something and said, all right, we're just going to kill all the good characters and we're going to have show con take over the world you know the evil guy we're gonna have him take over the world because that's pretty much what happened like all the good guys get killed at the end all of a sudden out of nowhere then the bad guy takes over the world it's like uh what what just happened <laughs> where where did this come from what just happened at least that's my recollection of the ending sorry to spoil it for any of y'all who plan to go and watch an, an, an obscure obscure show that you would have never heard of otherwise <laughs> Sorry for that long uh, rabbit trail there. I'm trying to see from Luke. Uh, Luke says, yes, you're, you're correct. Well, so if, if what you're trying to say is the parable of the Good Samaritan shows that works are necessary, um, as opposed to faith alone, um, a more educated Protestant is just going to say, yeah, of course, but those works just manifest that you're justified by faith alone. So, um <clears throat> the good the the good Samaritan is not going to refute a more educated understanding of sola fide. Um, if you want a refutation of more of an educated understanding of sola fide, I think you're going to have to work through Romans because I don't think Romans is in their favor. But you're going to have to do some heavy lifting and digging on what Paul's really getting at there. Uh Let's see. I saw the Batman with Jim Carrey as the Riddler. I used to love it back in the day, but now again, going back and watching it, it's it's pretty terrible. So Joker from the movie Joker. What's the 
is, is that the name of the movie it's just called joker really google this yeah it is called joker 2019 yep i like that one i i again i kind of felt well like nobody was gonna beat heath ledger and then he comes out and does this thing and it's like man i don't know i don't know i i kind of feel like maybe he beat heath ledger here i, I don't know Bane, I thought was ridiculous. Nicholas likes Bane. No, what? Bane, that one was so boring. I, I just can't. I couldn't stay awake with that one. That was boring. It's kind of like the one with Arnold Schwartz, Schwarzenegger in it. Nobody remembers it. It was pretty terrible. <laughs> Any ideas on making a home altar? Don't, don't ask me. I ended up turning my home altar into a full blown chapel now. So. <laughs> It's a it's a full blown iconostasis, fully functional liturgies and everything. So, <laughs> don't ask me; I'll turn it into a whole chapel. Um, no, serious. I mean, you you want to have just if you just want something basic for a home altar, just get a couple uh, candlesticks, uh, golden candlesticks. You can usually find them on Amazon pretty cheap. Uh, so, candlestick holders, getting at least a couple of those. Get um. Uh, if you, if you're Roman, right, just a white cloth or something like that. Uh, you should be able to also find those on Amazon for about 40 bucks. Um, get, um, a gospel, you know, have that placed on there. If you're Roman, right, you, you can also just, um, put a rosary there and, and, you know, have, um, holy water nearby. And, um, I think you got a pretty good home altar at that point. Um, then they also have some like desktop incense uh, thurbles, so you can get those as well. Um, hmm. I always go for the bad guy, Mike Lofton. Scandal, just kidding. <laughs> Why is it scandalous? If it's not in real life, I can hope the bad guy wins. Again, it's just so boring knowing that, you know, Deus Ex Machina, there's going to be this kind of out of nowhere, something's going to come. And again, Deus Ex Machina, save the day, and the good guy's going to win last second. Like right before the bullet hits the good guy, it's going to disappear. And all of a sudden, the good guy is saved, and then he kills the bad guy, and then he wins. It's just like, why? <laughs> <laughs> it makes watching most movies boring if the bad guy always wins i don't understand this obsession with the good guy always has to win uh <laughs> did i see the trent horn debate recently i the one on 401ks i saw it come up but i haven't watched it yet let me know if it's any good um let's see hmm. There's apparently three Jokers in the comics. I did not know. Uh, pineapple on pizza, yay or nay? Uh, H to the nay. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've never had pineapple on pizza, and I, I don't understand why anybody would put pineapple on pizza. And I know what a pineapple tastes like, and I know what a pizza tastes like, and I can imagine they don't go good well. Or they, they, they don't go well together. Cringiest episode of The Office. Um, the cringiest is obviously going to be um, Diversity Day. <laughs> 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 Which might, might be my second favorite Office episode. <laughs> I love Diversity Day. Oh, man, am I a woman? <laughs> From Dwight. Dwight says that. Y'all, y'all probably remember that if uh, if y'all are an Office fan. Let me know in the chat if you if you if you recall that scene from Dwight. Uh, still looking through. Um, do I have a picture um, of my home altar? Oh, not a updated one. Um, not updated. Uh, although I can get one for you. I 
I could certainly get one. Um, let's see. Because I've made some changes to it. Let me join the stream with my phone. See if I can do it that way. Show it to you like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me enter the chat. I mean, join the stream with my phone. I'll show you the uh, chapel. And we'll go from there. I'll return to questions after that. Um, see. Mm -hmm. see. It's asking me to log in here. Okay. So it'd be easier than me just taking a picture. Here we go. All right. You'll see me in just a second here as I enter the studio. Give me one second. There we go. <clears throat> See? So... As a layman, I don't go through the royal doors, but you can see the altar there. And it started out as a home altar. <laughs> uh, don't know how well you can see that right now. Um, the light's not on in there, of course, but kind of gives you a general, general idea. So... Trying to see. Hello. All right. Can you hear me now? I'm trying to make sure I don't have an echo. I'm trying to also kick my cell phone out of the studio and it's not letting me. That's. It's weird. <laughs> Not sure why it's not letting me kick myself out of the stream. I don't know. Hopefully that helps. Uh, let's see. I need a freestanding altar. Mm. Yeah, in the Byzantine liturgy, it's going to be um, freestanding. So that's why it's not up against the wall in there. Victor says, love the chapel. Thank you. Appreciate it. Very impressive. Thank you, Catholic Disciple. Uh, Thoringian says, I want to make one too. Not hard to do. Not hard to do. Ten screens, big tech guy. I, I am into technology. I won't deny that. Mm. Let 
Let's see. Um, you honor the royal doors in your own home. That's a true Byzantine Catholic world. Well, I mean, it's been blessed by the priest, so I don't, ever since it's been blessed, I mean, prior to that, I have to work, you know, I built the chapel, so I had to work on it, but since it's been blessed, I don't go through the royal doors as a layman. Um, if I have to go in there to do something, like go into the sacristy, I go through the, the, uh, the side doors. Um, okay. Freestanding is better than up against the wall. I like freestanding, but I mean that the, that way you can go. You know, the priest can go all the way around the altar and incense the entire thing. Uh, let's see. So my Eastern Catholic parish confession typically involves going into a small room within the royal doors. Is that not ideal? I mean, that's fine. I mean, as long as the priest is okay with you going through the royal doors, that's fine. Um, it's just that liturgically it's, it's only a priest that would, uh, do that. It's, that's especially during the divine liturgy, but it's good to use that as a rule even outside of the divine liturgy, but it's not this, you know, thing that you, it, it's not this thing that a, a priest couldn't allow for you to do, right? It's just a good and pious rule to observe. Um, thank you for the super chat. How do you see technology? Um, secularism impacting the church going forward. Many of the trends of the secular world are un unsustainable. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the more it, it seems like the more we have with technology, the easier it is to sin. Um, so it, there's certainly going to be a danger there, but it also seems like the more we increase in technology, the more we're able to make the gospel available to people. So it's, it's a give and take. Thanks, Michael. He says you have a portal portal to heaven in your own home. So jealous. Yeah. Um, no, he's pretty cool. I get to come here in the office sometimes and hang out and then go and pray vespers or something. <laughs> you know. <laughs> it's it's what's really cool is whenever the priest comes and I hear him say the name of Pope Francis during the liturgy. I always think that's interesting. Uh, <laughs> you know, just, just to know that there's a, a liturgy in communion with the Pope here at, here in my chapel is just the coolest thing, I guess. And then obviously, you know, the Eucharist and, um, you know, having, having the honor of that. What is the best TLM missile available? I like the, uh, what is it? The Campion one, the, the silver one, the one that has, um, I say silver, the gray one. I think it's the Campion missile. Um, I like that. Some pretty cool manuscripts in there. Yeah, the Edmund Campion missile. It's a gray one, not the children's one. Uh, Michael even makes his kids stand to play video games because if they can't stand during the divine liturgy, they can't stand during video games. That's funny. They never want to stand, by the way, during the liturgy. And I always have to make them stand during the liturgy. They never want to stand. They always want to sit. It's like, no, you, you don't do that. You stand. Please stand. Uh, but no, if they want to play games over here in the um, little area that I have with the TV and all that, they can they can play and they can sit down there. But the the liturgy half of the <laughs> of the office yeah that i have them stand <laughs> during <laughs> during those services i try i wish i had a wall dividing the studio here from that that outside maybe one day it just it would be too expensive right now uh do elderly have seats in an eastern catholic church well if i don't know if you saw but i have seats on the perimeter so we stand during the liturgy, but I have seats available in case somebody needs to sit. Uh, so yeah, most Eastern Catholic churches will have seats usually on the perimeter or something available for somebody who needs to sit. Um, I think that's good. Let's see. As long as you enter through the deacon doors whenever possible. Yeah, I usually just use the deacon doors. Um, hmm. 
altar stand 100 percent, no sitting i mean usually we stand during the whole liturgy the only time we ever sit is during the homily that's it daily script scripture reading i do one chapter of scripture a day at minimum sometimes two and it's chronological i just not chronological i should say because some parts of the bible aren't chronological um i go um literally cover to cover in the bible so um i'm just working through um the end of joshua right now and uh almost at judges so just you know go chapter by chapter um i think that might be it here favorite devotions for me it's going to be the jesus prayer um that's my thing but it's it's fine if you have a different devotion you know i'm not saying everybody has to have the same one uh but for me it's it's the jesus prayer do i take notes or just read what do you mean i don't understand oh you're, you're asking like during my my scripture time I, I see what you're saying i i just read um i don't normally take notes um during my scripture reading time maybe i should but i i did that a while bef back before and you could see like different bibles of mine all marked up and everything but um yeah now these days i just i just do the reading um let's see uh best homily that i've heard i'd have to think back on that one i've heard some good ones don't get me wrong i've i've heard some good ones and the priest who comes here gives some good homilies you say the best one i'd have to think on that one um let's see uh which would you say is the single most influential church father that exemplified the current teaching of the catholic faith the current teaching that's gonna be rough rough uh oh i'm gonna have to go with augustine here but there's a lot of aspects to his theology that the catholic church doesn't accept so it does not accept everything that augustine taught but i'm gonna have to say augustine now the cappadocians are right there with him in some ways so it's kind of i don't know that's a tough one that's a really tough one but I have to say Augustine has had a huge impact, especially in the theology as is expressed in the Roman Rite. But I know the church is obviously larger than the Roman Rite. Um, that's a tough one, really tough one. Do you even have the noose? <laughs> Kyle says. <laughs> well, everyone has a noose, so yeah. <laughs> uh, have i done a video on why the set of contests are wrong vis-a-vis uh, -vis the validity of the nova Ordo? i haven't done one specifically on that but i do know that um salsa and cisco in true or false pope tackled that one um and salsa will be on next month talking about why he's not sspx anymore maybe you can ask him then um why isn't the chalice offered in the tlm yeah i mean that's that's part of the uh that's part of the thing is it's it's an innovation to not give the chalice to the laity that was something innovative of the tlm um although i think that it was understandable why that happened historically so i'm not criticizing it but the council fathers did rightly say that you know we should restore the chalice because the circumstances that called for withholding the chalice in the roman right just aren't very applicable anymore uh what prayer book do i normally use um let me grab it here 
because I really want to show this to you. In fact, I'll probably do a whole stream on it, but I want to show it to you. Give me one second. I'll grab it. All right, so it's called A Simple Byzantine Breviary by Joel Barstad. Get it. Get it. Let me read the table of contents to you. Morning and evening prayer, daily vespers and matins, daily vespers, daily uh, or hours and typica. First, third, sixth, and ninth hour service of the typical compline and midnight office. Small compline, midnight office, Monday to Friday, Saturday, uh, Penicita, midnight, midnight office, Sunday, forgiveness right, comments for seasons, Paschal variants, Lenten variants, comments for weekdays. So you got some propers and stuff like that in here. Priestly prayers, litanies, Penicita, general Molibin. Uh, prayers of light calendar and calendar of saints so it's got some other additional resources in there but for me the big things are going to be vespers and matins um those are going to be the biggest ones they're worth this alone simple breviary byzantine breviary um i intend to do a, a show on it at some point um but definitely get that okay uh where did i get it i actually got this one in person at um the um saint john chrysostom in houston texas their little store area i got it from them but i i, I think it's on amazon so you should be able to find it on amazon uh Advice on finding fellowship in strong Catholics outside Mass. That's tough because in my area, I just don't have that. So I'm not able to do that. <laughs> I'm not able to give a whole lot of advice there. Um, the people who generally come to the chapel services tend to drive two hours, you know, an hour, 30 minutes. They're They're not local, so... Uh, okay. Was the Byzantine breviary always in the vernacular? Um, to my knowledge, but I, I could be misinformed there. I imagine there's going to be some variations among different countries at certain periods in time, but I, I could be wrong there. Um, Okay. I think that's it. We're right at two hours. So this is a fun AMA. And uh, we'll, we'll have to do it again next time. Maybe I'll throw in a few scenes from Joker or something. <laughs> we'll watch a few scenes and we'll review it together. We'll, we'll watch the scene where the Joker ends up uh, having that discussion with Murray. Maybe, maybe we'll do that one. Uh, <laughs> but anyways, all right. We'll see y'all later. Thank y'all, by the way, for watching. Hit that subscribe button. Hit the like button if you haven't already. I noticed 40% of my viewers are not subbed yet. Y'all need to hit that subscribe button, please. It helps me. And um, also check me out, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. Get access to extra content. I just put some stuff up today. Um, and also check out my, uh, my show, well, not show, my course on the Magisterium. If you want to understand the Magisterium better, go to maximusinstitute.com and you'll see my course on understanding the magisterium you'll learn more about it and it also again supports me so i'd appreciate it if you would do it um all right it's gonna be it y'all see y'all tomorrow god bless oh wait before you go i would really appreciate it if you would consider supporting this channel this is my primary means to provide for my family and it also helps me to produce content like this video 
If you would like to support me, become a patron by visiting patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. You'll also get access to extra exclusive content when you become a patron. Lastly, hit that like button and the subscribe button and be sure to leave a comment down below. God bless.